Good afternoon and welcome to Citrus and the Bonitao Institute and welcome to our 12th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. We're delighted to be with you today for our last uh, seminar, webinar of the year. And it's the best has been saved for last, uh, we like to say. Uh, my name is David Lindemann. I direct the Citrus Health Program and I'm delighted to be here today to present our series of present our presenters who have worked on our citrus seed grants this year. Normally we meet in Sudarjadai Hall. We look forward to returning to that venue in the, uh, in the future. Uh, not obviously it'll be a little while, but regardless, we have a wonderful set of speakers for you today to hear information regarding what we've been doing in addressing COVID response. Uh, today, we will have a process where we would like to make sure we have our speakers each present. We have four uh, individuals who I will introduce shortly. They will give their presentations. We would appreciate your waiting with, uh, for questions and answers until the end. Please submit them through the Q&A feature. Thumbs up, we'll bring it to the top and then we will not be using the chat for this specific program. Uh, so again, please put your questions and answers in. We will facilitate questions with all four speakers as the uh, afternoon goes on. And we will also make sure that you have access to each of the uh, fantastic uh, researchers that we have to bring to you today. Uh, so without further ado, because we have four speakers, I'd like to suggest that uh, the background behind what you're seeing today is that Back in March, in response to the outbreak of the pandemic, Citrus uh, uh, pivoted very quickly and launched a competition with seed grant programs that addressed technological innovation and how it could help us address some of the challenges that were occurring then and continue to this day. We are very fortunate that uh, in addition to uh, the resources that Citrus provided, we had an anonymous donor that supported funding 31 different research projects, all of which are, you can get access to and see uh, on our website. Uh, they were awarded uh, approximately $50,000 and with the goal that they would not only be able to rapidly move ahead in a few months, but also that they had scalability, broader application, and ideally have great impact to help society in this critical period. All are centered from investigators from our Citrus Four campuses, UC Berkeley, UC Davis, including the Medical Center, UC Merced and UC Santa Cruz. And we are now seeing wonderful results from a number of these programs. And that's what you will hear from today. So today we have four leading scholars and practitioners who are addressing the future of COVID-19. You're going to hear from Simo Makarju, who is a professor here at Berkeley, uh, looking at the experimental investigation of droplet transport of infectious diseases. Uh, Professor Li Wei Lin, who is working at at home COVID-19 detection on face mask program. And Professor Colleen Naughton, who is at UC Merced, looking at integrative quantitative microbial, microbial uh, risk assessment and geospatial analysis of the SARS CoV-2 uh, program, particularly in wastewater. And finally, uh, Professor Lydia Sohn uh, from Berkeley as well, looking at ultra-sensitive method of, to determine viral load of COVID-19 patients and looking at patient stratification and care. Uh, four superb programs doing great research. Uh, we are going to allow each uh, presenter to, uh, again, give their, their program. And then we will, as I said before, return in the last 15 or so minutes of the program for Q&A for all four of our speakers. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Simo, who will, in this case, I believe we're gonna be presenting his findings. He will try to join us. We have a, a video that he would like to present. And he, again, is in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and his main research interests have been in advancing the physical understanding of high Reynolds number single and multiphase flows through experimental research. So he, his work and that of Evan, uh, Varian will now be presented along with their students. And I will turn this over to our team who will start the video. By now, all of us have heard some discussion about SARS-CoV-2 spreading through droplets and aerosols. To make past progress on this topic, 
My colleague from civil engineering, Professor Evan Pariano and I, together with two of our students, Pivetni and Eric, teamed up to investigate droplet transport. A wider effort also involves a large team, including people from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and others. But I will talk about the part of the work that we are doing here at Berkeley. As we breathe, speak, or do anything, we humans are actually producing droplets over a wide spectrum of sizes. The droplets we produce range from sub-micron to those order of a millimeter. However, the droplets that are on the smaller end and the ones that we cannot easily see by eye are more numerous than the large ones. This flow of droplets with air is actually a multi-phase flow. Hence, it falls squarely within the area of interest to me and my colleague Evan. Given this, when the pandemic started, we teamed up and decided to do the most we can to contribute to the ongoing wider scientific effort. We began a systematic study of droplet transport over a wide range of parameters of relevance, spanning from scientific research experiments to generating material for public outreach. On the left, we see a repeatable respirator rig that coughed up simulated droplets. These droplets were made visible by fluorescence with color of the droplets identifying their size. While the emitting person got covered in their own germs in this case, the release to the ambient was greatly reduced. That is, as confirmed by countless of studies by now, even a simple mask can help reduce the spread of the droplets. Now, let's look a bit more into this fascinating and definitely presently relevant flow. When we discuss human-generated droplets, the word aerosol is often brought up. Aerosols are just small droplets, but we use this special term to identify droplets that are small enough to no longer behave like ballistic projectiles but they can instead linger in the air longer and they act more like flow tracers. An aerosol, such as the one you see here on the left, would mostly follow the local flow. A droplet, on the other hand, is what we call a droplet that has large enough size that the trajectory of the droplet is dominated by its initial momentum. Now, depending on the context, a droplet smaller than about 50 microns, which is the diameter of a typical human hair, a droplet smaller than that would be considered to be already an aerosol. As humans are not very good at producing the same droplet release event every time, we had to begin our research by devising a system to generate repeatable release events of droplets. Here on the left, we see one such release event with highly exaggerated concentration of droplets that we were studying in the very beginning. We actually used a device called Face Doppler Interferometer to quantify the generated droplet size distribution. For this research, we could use actual droplets or solid particles as simulated droplets. We actually use both for the reason that when we use solid particles, we have the benefit of diameter remaining constant as it is not affected by evaporation or condensation. The first step in our research was to generate a series of geometries used to study the droplet release. The geometries considered range from a realistic 3D printed model of a human airway based on a computer tomography scan all the way to a simple pipe. The reason for considering this wide spectrum of geometries was that the simpler ones are easier to analyze. However, those are often used in studies, but they do lose some physical relevant details. Once we had a way to produce the droplets and the co-flow of air, we needed to have a room, a room like no other on campus. We needed an environment free of thermal gradients, uncontrolled flow, and even free of electrical potentials. 
the additional requirement was that we had to use lasers powerful enough to burn through plastic in this room. <laughs> this might have had something to do with why it was better that we ended up using a simulated human being instead of a real volunteer to generate the droplets too. We built a room called the Cal COVID Cube, which is re uh, located actually in O'Brien Hall. With all the equipment in place, we began studying the release of droplets and particles, ranging from a release from pipe to a simplified geometry here in the middle, all the way to a more realistic geometry on the right. We also took some high-speed videos of these uh, particle release events, and as we can already see quite evidently, the pipe that is widely used in uh, a lot of the published studies, just for its simplicity, is definitely a poor substitute for anything more human-like, yet alone a real human, as the details of the release de uh, differ significantly. Here we see the release of particles from our repeatable respirator rig when we have a human-like release uh, geometry. This kind of experiment is great for relatability and for looking at the effect of masks and barriers for informing uh, human beings and being relatable. However, this kind of uh, geometry was not that easily leveraged for numerical model validation, hence we also did do a lot of work with the more simplified geometries. From the L1 semi-realistic model, we were able to get a lot of quantitative information too that is suitable for model validation. However, it begins to be less relatable because the released geometry no longer looks like a human being coughing. In this case, we are looking at particle tracking velocity results for particles coming out during a cough-like event from a simplified model. While there are many details we could discuss that we have uh, already discovered, and this could be a one-hour talk, in the interest of time, I will just show you one of our key findings to date. We have already also seen, and continue to investigate this further, that relative humidity in the room can have a significant effect on how the droplets spread. This has to do with the rate of evaporation of the droplets, and as you can imagine, the droplet that evaporates becomes smaller and behaves more and more like an aerosol and less and less like a cannonball. In this study, we used uh, fluorescein-laden droplets, and we measured fluorescein concentration deposited on these sample plates down to 10 parts per trillion, and with this measurement, we were able to quantify how the released droplets were deposited around the CalCOVID cube. With our research partners, our goal is to better describe how air flows influence the droplet and aerosol transportation from classrooms here at Cal to clean rooms, for instance, in manufacturing. The key thing here is that one size does not fit all, and there are a lot of uh, details to consider. And with that, we will move to our second presentation, and we'll talk with, I uh, have a presentation by Professor Li Wei Lin, who is also, again, a faculty member at Berkeley and runs the Berkeley Sensor and Actuator Center. And his research explores the design and manufacturing of microsensors and microactuators and development of micromachining processes on silicon surfaces. So without further ado, we will turn the program over to Professor Lin. Thank you, Davey. Uh, so uh, the original plan was that only five minutes for everybody to talk. So I'm trying to stick with that. So I only have uh, six slides, including the first one, this one, and the final conclusion. So uh, I'm actually going to present two projects funded by Citrus. The first one is the at-home test for COVID-19 control. Uh, that's together with Professor Shivo Roy at UC San Francisco. Uh, the second one is actually an air purifier uh, to uh, pure the air for COVID-19. That's together 
with uh, the university, uh, technological university in Monterey at Mexico. So each of the project, I only have two slides. The first one, I will just give you the overall scheme and the concept. And the second one, I will tell you what's the current result we are having. So the first one we are working on is actually we call nanostructure face mask. And showing this diagram and also following CMOS talk, uh, you can imagine that the spread of COVID-19 is typically from your mouth. Uh, either you're breathing, you're talking, and the virus is actually there. And the reason people are wearing the face mask is actually the major reason is preventing the spread of virus. In other words, the face mask supposedly will capture all the virus. So what we are thinking is that we can, if uh, we can make nanofiber, that would be about one order of a magnitude smaller than the current face mask fiber. And we can increase what we call the surface area to volume ratio about two to the seven uh, times or to do the 16 times. And suppose you're wearing the mask, for example, for six hours, and suppose each breast is carrying the same amount of the virus of the current PCR detection scheme. Six hours give you about two to the 12 times. And then we also have a solution accumulation scheme, and that probably give you two to the three or two to the four times more. And so together, we think we can amplify the virus on your face mask to two to the 20, two to two to the 31st. And this potentially is e kind of equal to the PCR testing uh, people are doing today because PCR is actually duplicate the DNA. And the detection method we are proposing is something that's easily identifiable by naked eyes. So the first one we're proposing is actually color change on the solution. And we are hoping everybody could do this at home instead of going to a hospital or sending your sample to the lab. We're also hoping the test could be done very fast, typically say in five minutes. So showing at the bottom is actually, suppose we have the virus on the face mask. The first thing we are going to do is actually call cell lysis and it's actually destroy the cell or destroy the virus. And uh, the second thing we're doing is that, for example, suppose I have this nanoparticle in blue color and this particular particle would actually uh, graph or interact with the virus. Uh, in this particular case, we're actually trying to do the, we call M protein on the COVID-19 virus. And then we think about five minutes of the hybridization, uh, the color actually could change and you can observe it by your naked eye. So this is actually the whole concept that we are hoping everything could be done at the room temperature at home and you can do the test, for example, every day because the current flaw for the testing is that you only tell you the current state. If you test negatively, it doesn't mean after 24 hours or 72 hours, you're still negative. So that is actually the goal and concept of this particular project. So let me show you our results. Uh, again, this is laboratory result. We started working on this in June. So we're pretty happy to see the current result. Uh, showing the photo here is actually this particular nanoparticle. Uh, it's actually made of a gold and it's actually binded with this NHS and this gold nanoparticle binding with NHS and it's actually uh, hooked up with this uh, uh, COVID-19 antibody showing in the right side. Let me see if I can have my laser point pen. Yes. Okay. Showing on the right side here. And then we actually uh, get this, uh, we call M protein uh, and this M protein will be very specific binded with the antibody showing in uh, this gold nanoparticle. And the binding result actually will get this nanoparticle to uh, aggregate together. And because of this localized surface plasma resonance effect, the aggregated arrog particle actually will change color. And uh, unfortunately, I do not have a better photo shown here, but uh, if you look at my laser pointer, you can actually see different concentration of this uh, M protein by the COVID-19 we've been testing and you can see different color, relatively speaking, okay? So if I conclude my current preliminary result shown here would be, we actually uh, could detect a detection limit about 10 nanogram per milliliter of M protein. And if I would make a very quick comparison that based on our calculation, the, the one that's already in use, I think including Firehouse is this Abbott um, 
by next now uh, COVID-19 go car, their detection limit is about 50 to 100 nanograms per milliliter. And their price is about $5. And so we think this has a great potential because even with very small amount of a sample, small amount of testing solution, which means could be very expensive, we estimate only require about 50 cents uh, to finish one test. So this gives you the potential and also the financial on this potential project. Uh, the next thing we are trying to do is actually uh, hopefully going to clinical trial uh, for testing the real patient. Okay. And the second project, uh, again, only two slides. Uh, the first slide kind of give you an idea. This is an air purifier. On the left side, the photo is showing if somebody is spreading the virus and after a long time, the virus is still in the environment. And on the right-hand side is actually, suppose we turn on the air purifier uh, being designed by us and also by the uh, Monterey, uh, Technical University of Monterey uh, in Mexico. And the goal is actually to clean the air in 30 minutes. And also we have a uh, virus killing scheme uh, into this particular air purifier that's not there in the current market. So hopefully we can do the uh, environment clean in a very fast fashion. So that's the overall concept. And this is actually the initial simulation result we have because we have to actually try to look into what kind of power we have to do. So this is actually close to my final slide. So the proposed uh, COVID-19 air purifier has these two interesting future. One is it's hydrodynamic control. And that is the expertise of Technical University in the, the Monterey. And also uh, similar to my first slide, the nanotechnology we're presenting here and trying to grab the virus as much as possible. So the central, central portion is showing actually the scheme that we want to do hydrodynamic control plus UVC light and also nanofiber for this very high virus capture efficiency. And the goal is actually to achieve 99.9% uh, purified air in 30 minutes for an area about 100 meters square. So the preliminary result showing here, uh, we can do very fast killing a smoke in a confined volume. I'm going to show you the result. And we have also showing very high surface charge potential for the nanofiber filter we have made. And let me show you an interesting result, I think right here. So this is actually a show video. Uh, ooh, sorry. Somehow the video doesn't show. Uh, maybe I have to get off the lesson pointer. Let me try. Yes. So this is a show video. Uh, this is actually a prototype air purifier. It's already been made in Mexico. So I want to uh, point you out, we actually can find a small area for now because we actually use a cigarette. I think it's going to showing up uh, about right here. You can see the cigarette uh, in here. So we actually put cigarettes, there are lots of smoke there, okay? And I think uh, in about this time, we turn on the power and doing the air purification mechanism right now. Uh, please forget about this uh, different color uh, LED is, is just for uh, beautification. It doesn't have any specific function, but within a short time, we actually could clean the very dirty environment uh, showing this particular demonstration. So these are the two very short project presentation I have. Uh, so my final uh, slide shown here. So the future work for these two, one is to further test toward clinical test for the first project. And the second one is to enhancing the capture efficiency via the nanofibers. And this uh, has been done with my graduate student as well as the graduate student in the Mexico. Also the Citrus uh, COVID-19C funding and also the Citrus IS, sorry, ITESMC funding. Thank you. Wonderful, Professor Lin. Thank you very much for that uh, very engaging presentation on two different approaches. Um, and what we will also be asking each of our presenters to do at, when we get to the Q&A, we've seen a few comments already will be, what will the future research directions be for each of these uh, different technology approaches to addressing COVID issues? So again, thank you very much. We'd now like to turn to Professor Naughton, who is an international sustainable development engineer, and, and she has done research both in North and West Africa, 
where she concentrates on global water, sanitation, hygiene, climate, and food security. And her work focuses on designing sustainable and culturally sensitive food, energy, water systems. We'll now turn the program over to Professor Naughton. Thank you, David. Uh, and thanks for this opportunity to present to you all today. Uh, so I'll be talking about our project of integrating risk assessment and geospatial analysis of SARS-CoV-2 in wastewater for vulnerable populations. I know that's a mouth mouthful, but we'll break it down. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between UC Merced and UC Davis, Dr. Maureen Kinua, uh, who is an uh, assistant professor in civil and environmental engineering at UC Davis. Uh, we also have two graduate students supported at the top and uh, some undergraduate researchers. Uh, so I have short time, so I'll try to be fast. Uh, first, a background on wastewater-based epidemiology, if you're not as familiar with it, uh, risk assessment, which Dr. Kinua is leading the effort on that. Uh, geospatial analysis, which my team is doing the mapping, uh, next steps, acknowledgements, and contact information. So wastewater-based epidemiology, you may have seen it a lot in the news right now, people uh, testing wastewater uh, for SARS-CoV-2, and it's happening at UC Berkeley, at UC Davis, uh, UC San Diego. There's actually a UC Collaborative, even UC Irvine, and UC Merced, we did start uh, taking some samples as well. Uh, so you can do it at dorm level or at wastewater treatment. And it might sound like a novel or new method, but it's been around for decades. It's measured poliovirus concentrations to target health and vaccination efforts. Uh, and it's been used since the beginning of the pandemic uh, in Arizona, in Italy, and throughout the United States. So estimated 40 to 80% of people shed the virus in their stool, whether they're uh, symptomatic or asymptomatic, and they can do it before they start showing symptoms, like start getting sick, and they shed up to 30 days after. Uh, but most of the shedding and higher concentrations happen at the beginning. And so you can measure uh, for hundreds or thousands of people at treatment plants or in the sewer system or at the building level and get this signal. And you get a test back similar to the individual test uh, with one to two days. And so if you normalize it, based on flow rate and others, you can get sort of an early warning system or smoke detection as some are calling it for uh, case increases. So it's shown to proceed, an increase in wastewater is shown to proceed cases by two to 14 days. And so this was where we pivoted our research a little bit uh, from the risk assessment and geospatial analysis as far as like risk to communities, but we, there was a lot of efforts going around across the world and we wanted to know how many universities, how many countries. So we've been mining a lot of data, uh, at Twitter and webinars and uh, publications and having people submit on Google Forms to an online dashboard. So we were inspired by the John Hopkins University dashboard for COVID-19 cases. Uh, so we're continuing to cont update this and hopefully uh, we can add uh, you know, actual concentrations over time. So it's a one-stop shop uh, right now, you can zoom in and click on the links for news articles, publications, or data and dashboards. And so for the risk assessment, uh, the quantitative microbial risk assessment, there's four main steps uh, to actually quantify the risk. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 is in the wastewater, uh, so wastewater workers might be uh, disproportionately exposed to the virus. So uh, the virus that's detected right now is RNA and RNA fragments, not necessarily uh, infective. Uh, so we think it's very minimal risk, but there still might be a potential there. We're tracking the literature for that. And these methods can be translated if we do have a fecal oral uh, pathogen or a future pandemic uh, to calculate the risk to our essential workers uh, treating our wastewater and also people living near wastewater treatment plants. They emit aerosols and they're closer to these treatment systems. Of course, treat, wastewater treatment provides a lot of public health benefits. We wouldn't want to not have that, but uh, certain people are disproportionately exposed. Uh, so Dr. Kinua, there's the four main steps and we're moving through them. Of course, the hazard identification is SARS-CoV-2. You can develop a dose response relationship based on how much of the virus you're exposed to based on your working or other conditions. Uh, and also underlying, we're looking at underlying health conditions for wastewater workers if they have diabetes or obesity or they're older. Uh, and you can see the probability of potential infection and you can estimate that. Uh, 
And so we released a wastewater personnel survey uh, and we've gotten over 45 responses, uh, participated in some California Water Environment Association and Sanitation Association webinars and we'll be expanding it nationally to the Water Environment Foundation. So if you know of any wastewater workers, I can send you the link and they can win a $25 Amazon gift card. Uh, and we've gotten some initial results about the personal protective equipment that they use, a lot of gloves, boots, safety goggles, um, not as many masks or dust masks, uh, but the CDC and World Health Organization say that the current guidelines for protection of wastewater workers is enough under SARS-CoV-2, but we're trying to verify that. And so some survey results, we want to know how much wastewater workers work with wastewater. So it's 25 to 50%, but there are some that are 100% like of their time, you know, 40 hours a week is with wastewater. And so moving to the geospatial analysis, we, are, we want to map this risk and also look at neighboring communities. So they're in the literature, it is showed that uh, Communities near wastewater treatment plants are exposed to aerosols uh, with fecal coliforms or fecal indicators. So there's a potential that they'd be exposed to other viruses and they've been shown to have nausea and like dizziness by living close by to treatment plants maybe that aren't as well maintained or uh, have other issues. So we've been mapping these first for the Bay Area and we're expanding. Uh, we have mapped for like over 300 in California but are confirming the data. So it's a pretty time intensive process uh, to do this. And we're looking at automating it with uh, certain geospatial tools and land use data. And so we see that a lot of wastewater treatment plants are less than 250 meters away, 84% in the Bay Area. And there's a disadvantaged community distinction for low socioeconomic groups and ones that have lower access to healthcare and are already burdened uh, near other uh, particulate matter, air pollution, or toxic releases. And so a lot of these communities are also near wastewater treatment plants, uh, 12 out of 14, 71% uh, um, in commercial areas and 14% in residential. Uh, so we are developing some guidelines and um, this is work I was working on in the Global, Pathogen, Global Water Pathogens Project before this uh, grant. Uh, just uh, you can provide trees or barriers or covers uh, or also make sure treatment plants aren't next to communities. Uh, provide more fine bubble aeration so you're not getting as much stirring up of the wastewater. Uh, and you can maybe limit ac or outdoor activities during peak treatment times. And so we're going, as I said, expanding this uh, and I'll talk about this in Q&A to California and continuing the survey and the analysis. And we wanna acknowledge Citrus, of course, for all their support and the donors, uh, our wastewater workers uh, providing an essential service at this time. So please uh, contact us for questions, uh, follow us on Twitter and look at our dashboard. Thank you. And thank you, Colleen. Uh, very nicely done. And again, a very critical area in terms of risk issues for individuals um, in, in dealing with COVID in the community in many different ways. We'd like to, like to next turn to Professor Sohn, who is uh, the uh, Maynard and Agnes Hallfield Maynard Chair in Mechanical Engineering here at Berkeley. And her specialization works in the uh, development of quantitative techniques to probe single cells and monitor and detect cancer. And she will now address the issues specifically related to SARS-CoV-2. Thanks, David. Um, thank you very much um, to the entire Citrus community for uh, supporting our work. And it's really fascinating to hear everyone's results and what they're working on. It's 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 really nice to see Berkeley being so active. Um, the whole UC system, sorry, Colleen, um, active in this um, pandemic. So I'd like to talk to you about how we're using an ultra sensitive um, detection strategy to detect SARS-CoV-2 in, in pooled saliva for community surveillance. Our project um, pivoted somewhat just because of how sensitive we were. And after talking with some doctors at UCSF on what you could do with a very sensitive um, test. So before I really go into my project, I'd like to acknowledge our, my team, which is um, consists of Thomas Carey, who is a bioengineering graduate student in my group, and also Dr. Molly Kuzminski, who is an NIH F32 fellow also in my lab. And together, they've just been an amazingly productive team. And 
what we've been doing is really leveraging our expertise in cancer monitoring um, in using um, to, to detect tumor derived extracellular vesicles in saliva. And basically, we're translating um, our technology into detecting SARS CoV 2 in saliva. So I thought I just would start off with just some statistics because last night I was just really um, just my mind blew in terms of the number of confirmed diagnosis in the US. You can see this is from the Johns Hopkins um, website showing how much we've really are entering into this exponential um, growth of confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19, as well as the unfortunate deaths of so many um, people in the United States. Now you can see that this is all starting from essentially March um, 2020. And um, what I thought I'd put down is really at the start of our seed project, there were 1.4 million people with confirmed diagnosis in the US. And now as of yesterday, we're at 11.2 million. Um, number of deaths when we started our seed project was about 90,000. Um, 90, and now we're at 245,000 people who have died. So I find that this, uh, it's, it's, it's just rather mind blowing, the, the statistics here. Um, oops. And then um, in terms of um, sort of some facts, so while we're waiting for a vaccine um, really to contain the pandemic, we really need sufficient testing. And there's been estimations that essentially different all countries need to be performing millions of tests per week. Um, the main drivers of this virus right now are asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic individuals. And um, currently the test, as many of you know, is really based upon RT-PCR of a specific viral sequence. Um, now, these tests surprisingly have low sensitivity, about one in five report false negative. So just because you've been diagnosed negative doesn't really mean that you actually are negative. And that's one of the, the main troubles, um, hurdles for testing for SARS-CoV-2. So in essence, what we need is just more sensitive tests and better strategies for testing, particularly since just we're in this exponential growth explosion of SARS-CoV-2. So what we're focusing on is something called sample pooling. And this was proposed by economist Dorfman in the 1940s as a solution to test US soldiers for syphilis. And it really is an efficient and inexpensive means for large scale testing. And there are, there are different um, methods. So the simplest method is really you have um, N different people and essentially you group them in equal numbers. So you just divide by the um, number of tests that you wanna initially start out with. And you just group and pool um, your samples together. And if one whole grouping turns out there's a positivity hit, then what you can do is then individually test all of the um, individuals in that one group that was found to be positive. The others will um, obviously negative. So that means that um, you don't have to test them. And you can automatically see how this is actually speeds the process of testing and also just saves on testing overall, which is a concern for um, SARS-CoV-2 given the limited amounts of reagents and so forth. Another method, um, it gets a little bit more complex, but also just more efficient in terms of number of individual tests that you eventually have to do. You still divide up all the individuals into a smaller groupings. And then essentially, if you find one that a grouping that's positive, then you can do another round of tests where you've basically group those individuals into smaller groups and then look for which smaller group has a positive hit and then you do the individual testing. Um, you could see that you, again, are still saving on the number of tests and it just becomes a little smarter in terms of being able to identify that positive person or uh, individuals that have um, whatever disease that you're looking for. And for us, it would be SARS-CoV-2. Um, with to optimize pooling for um, for any any particular disease or virus, and in particular um, SARS-CoV-2, you're very much dependent upon the limit of detection of your tests, the sensitivity and the specificity, as well as the prevalence of disease in the population. And we're working right now with um, Professor Ann Lazar, and um, who's in the Department of Biostatistics at UCSF, and Dr. Ralph Wang at, UC at the UCSF Emergency Department at Parnassus to, serve, to see how we can implement our pooling strategy and our testing method um, to detect um, SARS-CoV-2. Now, what is our method? 
it's rather simple. And again, it really is a takeoff on what we do to detect tumor derived extravascular, um, extravascular um, vesicles in, um, for cancer in saliva. But essentially, we take a saliva sample from someone. And then essentially, we label the sample, we add in oligos, short stranded oligos that essentially insert themselves into a lipid membrane. And the SARS CoV 2. Um, virus has a lipid membrane, so they can be tagged with these um, oligos, as well as other um, vesicles that may be in saliva. And then we uh, rely on the specificity of SARS-CoV-2 um, towards it, that it likes to bind to ACE2. So we have magnetic beads um, that are coated with, um, with the with ACE2, and essentially we pull down on those labeled or tagged um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, other vesicles do not bind to the ACE2, so they, those get washed away through a series of wash steps. And then finally, we do our PCR to essentially determine um, how, many, uh, how many virus we have tagged and identified. And the beauty of this is that we're not relying on a particular RNA sequence of the virus itself, and we're essentially studying the virus with multiple um, tags of oligos. So it's really our... our Sensitivity is dependent upon the number of oligos that we're able to use to insert into the virus membrane. Now, um, in terms of how we've been able to test our platform, um, obviously SARS-CoV-2 um, is a very, very infectious disease as we've already learned from the previous talks. And we would actually, if we were to use patient samples to do our testing and optimization, we'd have to go into a biosafety level three lab. So we actually, um, through uh, my postdoc, Molly, Dr. Molly Kuzminski, um, we relied on her chemical engineering expertise and she's developed essentially a, a SARS uh, mock uh, virus, which is essentially she's created a liposome that she um, studs with the, um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, spike protein. And this is sort of what it looks like. And she's just demonstrating here that here um, she that the um, that the liposomes are specific to ACE2 binding, which she has patterned onto a substrate surface and, and so forth. Um, another thing that we've relied on in, in terms of um, sort of optimizing our device, our platform, was to actually use um, pseudotype SARS virus or a pseudotype um, lentivirus that display the spike protein. And this we've actually relied on um, with, and it has now become a great collaboration with Laurent Coscoy and MCB at Berkeley and his graduate student, Christy Geiger. And essentially we learned of a technique through the Bloom Lab at, Wash at University of Washington. And we, he was very generous through his network. Um, it's actually kind of a funny story that we went from Bloom to Peter Kim's lab at Stanford, then to finally get um, the reagents and the cells that we need to be able to, dis um, to create these suit type um, virus. The overall, the main point is, is that with these two different systems, we can optimize our um, assay and we can do this in our lab in Citrus in Siddhartha Dai Hall. Now, this is just an example of some of the results that we're getting, and this is from the really the hard work of Thomas and Molly. And this is just showing you that we have essentially, this is a, um, a normalized uh, plot of, um, sorry, we normalized with respect to the uh, liposomes that do have spike versus those that don't, and um, normalize it with respect to um, PBS. But essentially what this is showing us is that we, can, we right now have an, it, we're able to quantify an absolute number of uh, our MOX uh, SARS virus, and we're absolutely we're able to measure um, an absolute number of ten to the fifth liposomes right now, or our MOC, mock virus. And um, in terms of quantity or volume of fluid, it doesn't matter. It could be from milliliters up to a liter. This is the absolute number that we can um, detect. So it really shows you how sensitive we are in terms of our measurement of our assay. So next steps right now, um, we're right now testing with spike saliva um, and we, there is some optimization that's left to do. Um, as I mentioned, we're initiating a pilot study with UCSF um, using patient samples to test out different pooling strategies for detection. And I should also mention that we're taking a portion of this project to develop a, a point of care platform 
um, to detect SARS-CoV-2, and this is in um, this is in collaboration with Kyle Enwar at UCSF and Vladimir Stoyanovich at um, Berkeley. So, besides um, beyond sample pooling, we could apply our um, our assay to other samples and to and to use it for other strategies such as the wastewater testing that Colleen was talking about. We can envision since we're so sensitive that wastewater management people can actually use our assay to detect the virus, or if they've already detected that there is a virus in a building or in a community, we can then apply our pooling strategy to determine and locate where the positive um, individuals are. And we also believe that our assay is um, broad enough that it could be used for future pandem pandemics. And so with that, I will conclude and say, acknowledge my entire group and um, all our really great collaborators, as well as really appreciate the Citrus COVID-19 Seed Award. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lydia, and all of our presenters. And we'd like to especially thank all of you for acknowledging the special environment that Citrus has been able to provide to conduct these types of projects. And again, acknowledge our colleagues across all four campuses who have done amazing work. This is these four presentations, they are outstanding and show just how far work has been uh, progressing. But we do have many more projects that have been underway addressing many different issues related to uh, COVID-19. Please do look, uh, we've included the link so that you can review those programs and we'll be presenting updates on those in the weeks and months to come. Furthermore, before we open this up to q and I'd like to make sure that you know that we've also listed either through LinkedIn or email the addresses for our presenters today. So you can reach out to them at any point in the future to understand more of their work. Um, I'd like to start by first again, thanking you all and just congratulating you for the amazing work that's been done. And it really does speak to what Citrus is all about, the translation of technology into the benefit of society. And the fact that each project has moved very fast to create not only a better understanding of what we're seeing with COVID-19 and the virus, but also leading towards uh, specific solutions to address it. So I would like to open it to, I believe, uh, unfortunately, uh, Simo is not able to join us right now. So three of our three speakers, um, who are still with us to address, uh, even expand on what you've already shared or what you see as next steps in your own research. I think that this is the critical issue we, we see because projects, pilots, the work that we do through our seed grants is to initiate that work, but it's how do we see it impacting and moving and expanding further down the road? You each identified several specific concrete uh, applications or research next steps, please feel free to elaborate. I think it's really important for our audience to understand what we're thinking about the future and how your projects and the field that you're focusing on can help us address COVID-19. So the floor is open to the three of you. Yeah, I, mean, I guess I can go uh, for our next steps. As we said, we're expanding to California, like mapping the treatment plants. We eventually, once the survey is uh, closed uh, at the beginning of December, analyzing and doing the risk assessment for wastewater workers and expanding and creating a vulnerability map potentially, uh, and just trying to integrate more of those recommendations uh, for the State Water Resources Control Board or other agencies to better protect disadvantaged communities throughout California and just overall throughout the US and also just better risk recommendations for wastewater workers, not just for COVID-19, uh, but for other viruses. And we'll continue to add to the dashboard and try to make it a more useful tool so people can use the wastewater data. Even once we, uh, like if and when we get a vaccine, we'll still need to use uh, wastewater and other testing uh, even to target vaccination events. Thank you, Colleen. Um, I'll, I'll just say, um, as I just mentioned, we're moving towards um, clinical testing um, to validate our assay and um, our algorithms for pooled samples. Um, I think that even with the announcement of the vaccines that will be um, distributed starting very soon, hopefully, it'll still take quite a bit of time. And so 
hopefully we'll be able to implement our assay, not just in the Bay Area, but other places as well. And, um, you know, I think COVID-19 is a virus here to stay, unfortunately. So hopefully in a yearly way, we could still be using our assay and also apply it to other viruses as well. Thank so you, Lydia. following uh, Lydia's comment, we are also hoping our face mask at home detection method uh, could be really useful. And the next step we're hoping to do is similarly, maybe a clinical trial, but we have to go through different stage. And the hope is something very inexpensive that you may be able to do the test say every day before you go to work and or every day you come home to make sure you are healthy without COVID-19. And for the second project, I think the next step we're doing is actually trying to uh, make the prototype and then do the, I guess, the uh, droplet test, uh, similar to what Simo has shown. And we're actually working with him to uh, kind of validate the efficiency and everything. And there is an interesting, uh, I guess, commercialization plan in the Mexico side. So in that particular project. Very nice. Um, and again, let me share that you're more than welcome as uh, attendees today to send in a Q&A to our speakers. Uh, so the Q&A se section is open. We would look forward to any additional questions there. But let me put, pose uh, one more that comes forward to all of you. Uh, given our research uh, environment and the number of research colleagues that have been involved in this amazing area of research to date, what lessons would you have to share with researchers working in the COVID-19 space at large in terms of new issues that came forward? Anything in terms of lessons learned in terms of research methodology, um, startup of your projects, challenges in terms of access to uh, sample material subjects, um, how implications for policies or research policies any uh, items that you could share with our colleagues in terms of lessons that you learned during the process of your specific research? Maybe I could start on this one. I think the, the most challenging thing for somebody not really in working in the biology is actually all the regulation, uh, all the testing procedure, everything we have to go through the internal review committee. I think Lydia is actually one of the committee members, so she must have a lot of uh, insightful information about the process. But for somebody not really in that area, that's an interesting process to go through. Uh, so we learn a lot in the process too. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can oh. Go ahead, Colleen. <laughs> I went first last time. But okay. No, I'll just say overall, we've learned a lot. I think COVID-19, like a silver lining has been just how researchers and scientists are coming together more and like sharing data amongst each other. There's like a whole wastewater-based epidemiology collaborative and preprint, preprints are more available and we're sharing data. There still could be more done as I show, showed on the dashboard. It's like 145 universities, but only 22 dashboards are sharing their data with the public and I know there's limitations to that, so I'd like to see more of that moving forward to uh, like help the public. Uh, you know, we just need all the tools available at this time. Uh, and also, it's just been really challenging to keep up with the literature. I mean, it has been a good thing, but also there's lower quality papers and things that come out. Uh, so it's like kind of hard uh, to evaluate and keep up. So Twitter has actually been really useful and like more of how I get my updates on research like it before I would go to the academic database and I still do that but uh, it, it's just in real time it's like happening now and I think with uh, the response to citrus from citrus and other funders how they can support us at this time has also been really great so yeah, um, I'll just add, I agree with everything that Colleen and Leeway has said. Um, yes, I am on this uh, institutional um, biosafety committee on campus. Um, we meet regularly, sometimes twice a week to go over um, various, how much all the different projects related to COVID-19 on campus. It's been pretty overwhelming for us as a committee. 
Um, I'd like to add that um, for us, we went in with like we were going to look at individual patients and, you know, try to map out sort of correlate viral particle counts. But it, it really was very helpful for us to talk to um, clinicians to find out what are the real pain points for them right now. And, you know, it at the time when we talked to the clinicians about our initial idea, their, all their comments were, we need sensitive tests. We need much more sensitive tests. We need um, at point of care. You know, they really weren't focused at that time on um, looking at long-term assessments of patients in the hospital. So that was a real eye-opening experience to us. And I think it just really helps to talk to and reach out to all different disciplines who are involved in COVID-19 because then new ideas come out and you can see where you can make a contribution and so forth. And that's a perfect segue into just our last question. I'd love to ask you each just in our closing minutes to take uh, just a, uh, less than a minute to say, uh, what do you see as some of the most important next steps in research? Uh, again, writ large across all of our colleagues and the work we're doing, what would you argue for? Uh, again, we want to thank especially the donor, anonymous donor who has supported all these projects, but we know that both uh, public and private sources are looking forward to how do we keep advancing research here? So I'd love to have you each make your own comment as to where you see an important next step will be for the research community to consider as we're still tackling the challenges of COVID-19. Um, I think I already checked on it or uh, talked about it is just, yeah, making the data more available and public, especially in the wastewater space so we can use as an early warning system and there's a lot of places that are using it pretty well and communicating, but some where it's like kind of the wastewater, like workers or like uh, municipalities like really like the data, but like we need it to be actionable. So Australia based on their wastewater testing, like was like doing mass like targeted case testing uh, when they saw increases. So just being able to use that to better like prevent and mitigate the outbreaks. Thank you, Colleen. And Lydia and Lewe, any su final suggestions about next steps for future I, research? I can go next. I think for me, maybe for other projects, I think resource is very critical. We mm -hmm. were really thankful for the donor uh, have this initial funding. But I think like all the projects, if we want to push out to something more for practical usage, uh, for example, we have to demonstrate lots of issue, including very large manufacturing capability, uh, real testing, real patient, that require actual funding. And that's the, again, that's one thing uh, quite critical for probably most of the project at, at the current stage. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would also agree with Li Wei. You know, we're at that next juncture of, you know, we need to expand. And so, you know, we're rapidly, we're writing a lot of grants right now, but we're one of a million who, are, who keep on submitting things to NIH related to COVID-19. So it is competitive, but I think that that's also what was great about the Citrus Seed um, Awards, that it really helped us launch Things so that we could get the preliminary data to and to expand our work and really hopefully um you know hopefully we'll all be better prepared of how to handle the next pandemic you know what we can do uh, really well said by all of you and but it also uh really speaks to the importance of our next steps and again all the work that you've done and where it will lead in the future but we want to thank you and congratulate you on the contributions you've already made and all of our researchers through the citrus seed uh, program, but to also all the other researchers across our, not only our campuses, but across the globe that are addressing these issues. Uh, we have many challenges ahead, but it, we're making fantastic progress on that. So with that, we'd like to bring today's session to an end. I'd like to thank you again for joining us for the citrus seed um, program, but also our research exchange in general. We will be announcing our, our research exchange program for next semester in early January. So please go to our website for further information. And all the recordings, including today's, will be available on the uh, fall 2020 Citrus Research Exchange playlist, which is on our YouTube channel. So again, you can always follow up with that.
and you also have opportunities to reach out to today's speakers. So on behalf of Citrus and the Bontau Institute, I'd like to thank our speakers today, thank the audience, and again, wish you all a great day and a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.